it is almost complete. Just takes a second to get that all connected. One moment. It says webinar is now streaming live on Facebook. All right, we did it. It's magic, everyone. <laughs> all right, I'm also going to hit record here. All right. So I am going to go ahead and kick us off. Uh, my name is Jack Spinkel. I am the Executive Director for Texas Normal. And thank you for joining us for our January meeting. We have a really exciting lineup tonight. We have our lobbyist from DC, Justin Streckel, here to talk to us and give us a little bit of an update. And Stephen Carter and I are also going to talk about Texas legislation, COVID restrictions, and some other topics. So what I want to do first is give it over to Justin so that he can talk to us about the updates from the Capitol, what we might have in store ahead of us. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so very much, Jax. Uh, really excited to be here tonight to talk about federal policy. Uh, it, it is certainly a, a different list of things I'm going to be talking about than when we uh, first talked about me joining tonight. Um, just because things in Georgia have certainly changed the dynamics for the, the U.S. Senate. Um, and, and, and as I'm sure everyone is well aware, there, there are currently uh, massive problems in an attempted coup in Texas, at, or I'm sorry, not in Texas, at the Capitol right now. Um, so that is, that is just further complicating um, you know, efforts and, and, and we'll, we'll see how that all shakes out. It's been, uh, watching that unfold today has been really, uh, really gut-wrenching to be honest, um, watching the people's house be, be stormed. Um, but, but the focus tonight is, is, is marijuana policy at the federal level. So I, I will dive in and keep my comments focused on that. Um, for just to, I'll start off by doing a brief recap of what happened in the previous session of Congress, the 116th session and then how that lays the groundwork for the session that was just sworn in on January 3rd um, for the beginning of the 117th Congress. Um, in the 116th, we uh, marijuana policy reform saw historic levels of engagement in, in, in the House of Representatives and relative stagnation in the, in the US Senate. Um, you know, unfortunately, under uh, the leadership of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, the, uh, the Senate did not advance any substantive cannabis policy reform uh, during, during the, the tenure, um, but it was not for lack of options that were sent over by the House of Representatives. And uh, the, the first piece of legislation that was passed in the House was in September of 2019, known as the Safe Banking Act. Um, this is something that is, you know, for, for any of you who, who have gone to a legal dispensary, it's highly, you know, be it if you're part of the teacup program um, in Texas, or if you've traveled to another state and gone to a dispensary, you've likely had to pay in cash. And that's because as of this moment, the, the state legal cannabis, biz, uh, cannabis industry is, is predominantly a cash only enterprise because federal prohibition and criminalization uh, means that banks do not want to take on the liability of essentially laundering illicit drug money. Um, so that's why where we're currently in the state, it's bad for consumers, it's bad for business. Um, I can't imagine running my personal life without a bank account, let alone a business. And I know that in, in this day and age of COVID, where we're seeing consumers rapidly move towards home delivery or curbside pickup, um, and just have concerns about any kind of personal interactions with people, um, reducing the, those cash transactions by allowing marijuana businesses access to basic banking services um, would is an incredibly important thing. So the House first passed the bill on a standalone vote in September of 2019 on an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote, passed with 321 uh, members voting yes, all but one Democrat voted yes, and 45% of the Republican caucus voted yes. Um, th that represented the first time a standalone piece of legislation that would legitimize the, the emerging state legal cannabis uh, industry 
had ever passed in the Chamber of Commerce. Um, but we had a lot more to do. Um, flash forward to 2020, we saw the Safe Banking Act be included in um, two iterations of the HEROES Act, which was a COVID relief package um, that was put forward by House Democrats that, that passed the chamber once in May and then later, excuse me, um, in, in the fall. Um, and while we're working with um, the, the House Finance, Financial Services Committee and House leadership, they understood that including safe banking as part of a COVID package, considering that the majority of states in this country have deemed the marijuana industry as an essential service um, during the COVID pandemic, that allowing them these basic banking uh, protections so that way they can get access would help mitigate the risk of contagion of cannabis consumers to touch points um, uh, for, for COVID transmission. So we, we were really, really pleased that, that House leadership was receptive to its inclusion in, in the COVID package. Um, so overall, the Safe Banking Act passed the US House of Representatives three times in the previous Congress. Um, but that was not the thing that I was very most excited about and happened last Congress. Um, and, and what I was most excited to, to, to that we were able to see happen in the House was the, the successful vote on the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, or simply put, the MORE Act. Um, I'm sure any of you on, who, who, who are on the normal email list have gotten a number of messages from us um, asking you to contact your lawmakers with our action alerts, asking you to call your lawmakers, asking you to share our action alerts on your social media so that way we can drive in more constituent contacts. And that was very intentional. Um, we drove in over a quarter million messages to Congress in support of the MORE Act over the course of the, of, of the two-year session. And that's the highest level of, of constituent engagement ever um, done by normal, which leads me to very much believe that it was the highest level of constituent engagement uh, from any uh, marijuana, uh, on any marijuana policy legislation, um, because we are the biggest and with the furthest reach. And um, the MORE Act is, it's, it's imperfect legislation, but it's absolutely consequential legislation. And its passage in the House last year demonstrates that the House of Representatives is willing to take up legislation that would remove marijuana from the Controlled Substances Act and have additional structures which would allow, which would create incentives for states and local governments to both facilitate the expungement of criminal records for those of our, our, our friends who bear the scarlet letter of a, a criminal conviction for simple marijuana charge. And it would create incentives to promote local and diversely reflective ownership through grants and, and loans and, and access um, uh, permitting assistance uh, through the Small Business Administration. And it's, you know, so they're, they're, the, what the MORE Act didn't have is it didn't have a, a post-prohibition regulatory framework to help us move towards a standardization of weights and measurements and, um, you know, ensuring that, that we're going to have interstate commerce, have, have common rules of the road. But that's because as of right now, it's incredibly complicated when every single state that is legalized is its own unique regulatory structure. So that's going to have to be something that, that works itself out under federalism um, or a federalist structure and, and, and the emerging economy. But the, the MORE Act, it's, its significance as the first ever vote to end marijuana prohibition and criminalization cannot be overstated. And, and we were incredibly pleased to see a strong vote. Um, all but five members of the, of the House Democratic Caucus voted in favor of the bill. And we even had five members of the Republican uh, caucus, as well as 100% of the libertarians in Congress um, with Justin Amash, uh, uh, for now former congressman. I'm, I'm sad to see that he's not returning to Congress, um, but Justin Amash voted for it as well. So um, it was bipartisan, right? And it was, um, you know, it just, it, it really, it really sets the stage for us to be able to continue to um, improve the legislation. When the, the MORAC was first introduced, a lot of people 
um, in the cannabis community and outside of the cannabis community said that it would never happen. Um, but working diligently with with civil rights groups and 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 uh, other groups as well, we were able to get that legislation passed. And the reason was was its focus on the the criminal ending the criminalization of marijuana federally and the relief that it would provide to individuals who, in their day to day lives, are still being held back as a result of a marijuana conviction on their record that prevents them from being able to do things like get a you know get access to employment and a job get access to housing get access to higher education support and the laundry list of other consequences that that are uh, associated with having a conviction so now that people are taking the bill seriously it it came under uh, intense amounts of scrutiny it does have ways to be improved we're very much looking forward to to more people providing uh, constructive suggestions on how that's going to go as we seek to uh, what kind of changes we want to see made in that legislation before it's reintroduced in the new Congress. So that's going to be something I can't give you a hard timeline right now as far as when the bill is going to be reintroduced because we're, we're talking to a lot of different stakeholders. Um, but those are ongoing conversations. We're really excited about how, how they're unfolding. And, and we, hope to, we hope to be able to make waves really soon um, with, with advancing that legislation yet again. Um, so that's the 116th Congress, which sets the stage for 117. Um, as, as, as we saw in the 2020 elections, uh, House Democrat, the House Democratic Caucus maintained their control of the chamber um, with a slimmer majority, with Republicans picking up a number of seats. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, like I said, only five Democrats voted against the MORE Act. Two of them will not be returning to Congress uh, or have not returned to Congress this year. And all of the Republicans who voted in favor of it have returned to Congress. So we believe that there's room for growth um, in, in the number, in the, in the level of bipartisanship that we can have on this legislation, um, as well as, you know, again, Hopefully, now that we see the, the results coming in from Georgia and knowing that Georgia is going to be sending Reverend uh, Raphael Warnock, as well as John Ossoff, to the U.S. Senate, that is going to create the 50-50 split in the chamber, which will give the committee chairmanships over to Democrats, with Vice President-elect uh, Kamala Harris being the tie-breaking vote. Um, so that way, it, it's our sincere hope that uh, unlike the previous Senate, we'll be able to advance cannabis legislation through the committee structure. Um, but that's not to say we're going to be able to get it on, onto the floor. And that's because I'm sure any, any astute observer of, of the U.S. Senate um, who, who is familiar with the filibuster already well knows um, in the Senate, it's not just about, it's, it's not as easy as bringing a bill to the floor and having it get a majority vote. It first has to clear a procedural hurdle known as cloture, which requires 60 votes to be able to overcome. And that can be invoked by any member of the Senate calling for a cloture vote, which is one of the leading reasons why we see the, the Senate unable to accomplish meaningful legislation on any issue under either party um, in the last couple of decades because of the use of invoking cloture votes on every single bill that, that could possibly come up. Um, so that's not to say that there's that we're not gonna get anything done regardless. I think that by advanced, by having the ability to fight tenaciously to advance legislation out of the committee process, that's gonna put us in a really strong position to be able to find ways to attach different pieces of, of policy to moving legislative vehicles that are deemed must pass. Uh, the closest analogy that I can put here is how every, you know, every um, year, every other year, the, the, the Congress passes the farm bill. Um, and in 2018, this is how we were able to, with Senator Wyden working with Senator Mitch McConnell um, in a bipartisan fashion, attaching the, the rider to the farm bill that ended the federal prohibition of marijuana with 0.3% THC or less, or as we commonly call it, hemp. Um, so we really hope that, um, you know, given that, that given the broad support amongst the American public, regardless of partisan ideology, that uh, marijuana 
is in a good p position to be attached to a b bigger package. And we're really hoping to be able to make some substantive policy changes in, in this new Congress. Um, so that's that's the 30,000 foot uh, perspective. Jax, I don't know if, 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 if you think I missed anything um, or, or if we got any, Q I, I think I see a couple Q and A's coming, but I don't know. Yeah, if I just wanted to remind, if you're watching on Zoom, drop your questions in the Q and A box. We're gonna be actually doing Justin's right now because he has to leave. He won't be able to stay with us till the end. And I also see some questions here on Facebook. Um, so I'd like to start with two clarifying questions. So Frederick was saying, oh, you know, the more passed, so now it's legalized. And I think that he needs maybe some clarification on how it went through the process, right? It passed the House, but didn't make it to the Senate. Correct. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Jack, Jack is just asked and answered. Uh, we, we only passed it in one chamber of Congress. And uh, unfortunately, by by a bill passing in one chamber of Congress, it doesn't automatically trigger consideration in the next uh, in the other chamber. And this is something that Jackson and, and all, all all of all of your amazing activists in, in Texas know. You know, just because you got it through one chamber doesn't mean that the other chamber is going to take it up for consideration. And ironically, it seems like Texas is kind of like D.C. The House is a little bit better on the topic, and the and the Senate's a little bit stricter. Yeah. Um, also, Angela, you know, you alluded to some of the amendments that were made to the Moore Act and that it was less than ideal and that you're wanting to get some, some of those things improved for next time. Can you maybe touch on one or two specifics um, that could be improved? Absolutely, yes. So at the, with the Moore Act, what was, the, the way that it was crafted was the legislation was designed to be fully paid for. So we wouldn't be asking for a nickel from the general taxpayer fund, um, and the way and to be able to fund the important incentives for to cover the costs of the expungement programs, as well as the SBA programs to promote local ownership. So we needed to create a new tax, uh, a new a new uh, tax structure, uh, to be able to get that done. Right. So anybody who opens a business, you need to apply for for an EIN and get a, get your permit to be able to pay your taxes. So at the last minute, without really seeking substantive feedback from the, the advocacy or industry community, the, um, it, it, the language was inserted in that included a provision that could be broadly interpreted to be uh, used in a very discriminatory way. And, and what the language said was, um, at the discretion of, of the, the permitting uh, situation, and again, this is just a permit to be able to, to uh, be able to file your taxes. We're not talking about permitting in the sense of a license and, and the application that businesses have to go through at the state level. There's a lot of confusion out there. People hear permits and, 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 and at the federal level, the permitting question is literally just an ability to be able to pay your taxes. Um, there, there was the, it did give the possibility um, for the regulator to be able to deny permit requests from those who have a cannabis conviction on their record. Um, that clearly is something that we do not want to see happen. That clearly actually undermines when, when, we, when we see the, the social equity programs that are emerging in cities and states around the country as they experiment to try to figure out the best ways possible to promote local and diverse ownership in the emerging economy there, some of those, those, those programs actually um, put at the front of the line for licensing consideration, those individuals who've had a, who have a criminal record for, for cannabis, right? So um, clearly that's something that would be a direct conflict. It, it wasn't an automatic permit. It was a discretionary uh, judgment. So, you know, it, it, it was just something that, that slipped by, you know, I think when you know, I, I, I do like I do think that it was um, it was not done in bad faith, but it was just badly written. Um, and we have received a, a, a strong commitment from the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Richard Neal, that that language will not be included moving forward. So we feel really good that we're going to address that issue moving forward. But it was an incredibly frustrating thing to see happen in the last week before the vote when that language got substituted in um, to, to, to see that get added. And it really like took away some of the good feelings of, of the bill getting passed. 
Um, but I, I, I can say with complete confidence that language is not coming back. Um, another, another piece of language that, that was shoehorned in at the last minute um, at, at the behest of concern mongers was um, language that would uh, reinforce the existing federal agency uh, uh, ability to discriminate when it comes to employment practices for consumption, be it through pre-employment drug testing or random drug testing. It's not something that is, 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 would make the current existing policy any worse than it already is, but it would affirmatively reiterate that that is the position of Congress when it comes to um, how Congress can do testing. And that was very frustrating to see it get added because we, we certainly, by, by having it be silent, we weren't, you know, it wouldn't have been changing those policies, but, but it would have been a signal to agencies to change their policies. Um, so that's something that we're gonna be fighting about so that way we're trying to make sure that it doesn't get included again uh, moving forward because we certainly don't want cannabis consumers to be unduly discriminated for employment in the, in the public sector. And we, we certainly don't want the private sector to be able to point to the public sector and say, hey, look, you know, if the government is discriminating against cannabis consumers for employment, then we're going to as well. Um, so it, it's going to have cascading effects. Um, so that, that's something that we're going to be fighting to, to try to make sure we can get it much better uh, moving forward. Thank you for the feedback on that. I know it was it was like such a big win. And then people were like these amendments, though. So I think it's really great that um, you have a plan and that the conversation is happening. There's a few questions I just want to hit real quick before you have to go. Sean is wondering, so the MORE Act, would it cut off federal grant money for arrests? you know, um, how they have somewhat incentivized arrests in some states. Is that something that the, any of these bills have addressed? So uh, under, under federalism, uh, you know, it's the overwhelming number of state of, of marijuana related arrests are done by state and local law enforcement, not federal. And as far as, you know, I'd have to know what grant programs he, he's speaking to specifically, because um, maybe, maybe we're thinking about different things. Um, you know, but, but what this would do is it would, it would send the signal that you're not going to be able to, to, to benefit from the incarceration of individuals over cannabis. Um, so I, I, I can't speak to whatever specific program that, that, that the question is talking about. Um, but no, I, I think that it would have the, the compounding effect of it incentivizes states to, by providing grant money if they provide expungements to individuals. Um, so I think it, it, would just, it would just flip the incentive structure on its head. And, and I think that's the direction we need to move. Awesome, flip the script on that. So another thing that the expungement portion of the MORE Act is what we'd be addressing here. So Jess wants to know, would national security clearance jurisdictions be included in the expungement portion? So therefore, um, would I be able to still get national security clearance? By the look on your face, I feel like you're like, ooh. That, that's an intriguing question that I don't, I, I, wanna, I wanna start off by saying, I'm pretty sure I, I know the answer to it, but I don't wanna be like, you know, don't, don't, I, I, I am not a lawyer um, with, with an expertise on, on national security clearances. Um, it, it's, it's my understanding that if you get a record expunged, then it, it, it can't be held against you. I don't know if there's some kind of an additional level of scrutiny where going through that security clearance process, they're able to unearth the records. Um, and also just on that issue, when we talk about expungements, it, it's it varies state by state um, and locality by locality between is it a, is it a cl an absolute clearing of an in a, of an expungement is it a record sealing so that way it's not publicly accessible and but it could still be on record um, or or those and then there's there, there's a difference between that and then a pardon um, every state is is different in how they they deal with those programs or, or those kind of of, of legal definitions. So I, I'm not 100% sure whether or not if it's a state that's doing a, a record sealing, that would still protect you going through a security clearance process. Um, so that, that, that's a really good question. And I wish I could give you a much more definitive, confident answer. 
Um, well, lot- now Jess has given you something that you can research and perhaps include in something in the future. Thanks, Jess. Also, thank you to everyone who is blessing me in the comments on Facebook for my sneeze. I thought I muted myself, but I guess I didn't. So it's Cedar. Don't worry. Um, last two questions. So Ricardo wants to know, do any of the bills affect drug testing in the workplace? No. Um, you know, unfortunately, when, when we talk about the private sector, the, the workplace, the public sector and private sector, right? So, so as, as, as I was previously discussing about the drug testing, the bill doesn't mandate that agent, that public, the public sector um, for, for federal employees, for federal contractors, et cetera, it doesn't mandate that they don't discriminate. Now, there is a, a clear um, position in the bill that prevents um, for the discrimination of public benefits for a marijuana-related uh, record or marijuana consumption. So if, if you're a senior and you're on Medicare, you're not going to be able to be denied Medicare or your Social Security um, because you you smoke pot, right? Um, so there there are those kind of protections for public benefits, but for employment, it is an agency by agency, director level by director level decision. So that way, we we would expect you know in the Department of Transportation, for example, that you know for those those who are operating you know trucks or, or or vehicles of any kind that's considered a safety sensitive position, they would still be conducting drug tests, and that's that that gets into the whole insurance issue because we don't have the any technology analogous to a breathalyzer and there is a possibility that we never will that the you know it's just kind of in the 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 cya if, if you will um of of i don't know if i'm allowed to swear on here but the, the cover your ass um oh no. uh, <laughs> so, um but you know so so that that gets in that for the public sector for the private sector this is one of those areas where it, it's it's largely going to have to be done at the local and state levels as far as um, guaranteeing employment protections for individuals uh, who, who are cannabis consumers. Uh, because un, under the federal structure, it would be improper for the federal government to make that kind of a dictation um, down to, to state and local governments under the 10th Amendment. So, so no, it, it, it doesn't have anything like that in the private sector. Okay. Um, so something that you guys fight for in, in Texas once you establish the legal right to consume. Right. So last question for you, and it's going to be from our friend Julian. You know Julian. Hi, Julian. Good to see you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you know how in Texas, whenever hemp was legalized at the federal level, it legalized it here as well. And within a certain amount of time period, we had to adjust our registry of drugs to coincide with the federal uh, registry. So his question is, if the federal MORE Act passes and removes cannabis from the CSA completely, mm-hmm. and then Texas has to go through our process to follow suit, does that make sense that essentially it would kind of force Texas to also decriminalize? And if not, ex- can you explain why? Yeah, no. So, so the, the federal descheduling of hemp ended the federal prohibition of hemp, but s- similar to, 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 to medical marijuana or adult use marijuana, there were already states that had at the state level legalized the hemp industry. So when, when the feds descheduled, they said, hey, states that have a, a, a state level hemp industry, you need to come into compliance with these guidelines and get your program approved by us. Um, so it's, it's not so much that the federal descheduling of hemp forced Texas to legalize hemp, it just forced Texas to, for its, its state hemp program to be certified by the feds. Or we'd have to go under USDA's regulations, right? So just so you know, my understanding, and I'm going to have to double check to make sure I'm not wrong, is that in Texas, it is part of the way our controlled substance list, we call it our registry, works, is that we reflect the federal one. And so it might be because we actually, in March, before the bill ever even passed in June, we already knew that it was de- going to be descheduled, the hemp stuff. Uh, so I'm going to have to research that a little bit more. Yeah, no, if, if that is the case, Texas would be the first state that I'm aware of that has an explicit tie to the federal government. I'm um, going to research that, and then I'm going to circle back with you and Julian. 
Yeah, we we saw states implement their Controlled Substances Act to be reflective of, of the Federal Controlled Substances Act in order to maintain, you know, similar, um, so, so that way there's not problems. But we certainly, every state has their own Controlled Substances Act. And, you know, again, just under, federal, under our federalist structure and under the 10th Amendment, you know, most states have chosen to, to or, or every state that I'm aware of, Texas would be the, the first state that, that, um, that, that did that, if that is the case, um, that, that I'm aware of, that, that has it somehow tied. No, they're, 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 every state has their own independent level, and it's just coming into comport now that the federal law had changed um, in, in order, but, you know, all these hemp programs were already in clear defiance of federal law prior to federal descheduling of hemp. So just as we have 36 states um, with a medical program now, they're all in clear defiance. In the event of ending federal prohibition, now those states would just simply no longer be in defiance. So they would, so those businesses would be able to get access to banking services. They'd be able to get access to uh, equitable tax treatment. Because right now there's a provision in the tax code that prevents marijuana businesses from taking any standard deductions. Um, this is per, uh, acutely important during a global pandemic when the federal government in, in, in all of our, our wisdom, we've decided to incentivize health, uh, health insurance through an employer sponsored model. And we, we do that through the federal tax code. So right now cannabis businesses aren't able to get the incentives mm. that the federal government provides to businesses to provide health insurance to their employees. Um, so so in, in the midst of a global pandemic, that's, a, that's just another, that's the, way, that's the one that I point out the most to the federal lawmakers. Um, there's a lot of different other things. So no, if we deschedule, like let's say we descheduled marijuana tomorrow and, 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 and the president signed the bill tomorrow night, um, marijuana would still be just as illegal in Texas until Texas changes their laws affirmatively. Um, it, it took a, just about a, a, just over a decade um, after the fall of alcohol prohibition for every state. To, to set up a, a regulatory structure governing the, the production and sale of alcohol in their states. And even to this day, we, we see dry counties spotting the countryside um, where, where the, the retail sale of alcohol is still prohibited. So I imagine um, I'm hard pressed to see cannabis um, do anything different than, than that model of, of, of ending prohibition. I think it'd be wholly inappropriate for the federal government to, to mandate that states um, change their policies on this because I think that opens up a lot of doors that, that we might not, like a lot of doors that we don't wanna open about federal control and assertion um, regarding the, the, the regulation of, of industries. Um, so though, those are, you know, it, 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 a lot of this is, 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 is um, ideological philosophy, right? And just like what, and this is why we have two parties and what they bring to, um, to, to, to the table. Um, so there's a whole lot more work to do, but I think I, I'm very excited to confidently say that for the first time in history, we have a House of Representatives where the majority of its members have a voting record of, of, of casting a vote to end marijuana prohibition. And once the two senators from Georgia are seated, we will, for the first time in U.S. history, have a Senate majority leader in, in, in Chuck Schumer, who is vocally in favor of ending federal marijuana prohibition and encouraging of states to legalize the substance um, at the state level. And, and that is, I did not expect to be able to say that today when, uh, <laughs> you know, when, when I went When you to woke up in the morning? <laughs> when, I, when, I, when, I, when I went to bed on Monday. Um, when I woke up this morning and, and I saw the, the results in Georgia and, and felt confident that it looked like the, the two Democrats were prevailing and that, that, and that there would be a power shift. But these, 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 are, these are wild times. And um, Well, the good news is, is that we have receipts on the fact that Schumer and Harris have both said that they would support this. Um, very and many. So, <laughs> very many receipts. That's right. Well, Justin, I know that you have another event that you have to get to tonight. That's no problem. Um, thank you so very much, Jack, for having me. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. And oh, I, I before I came here, just throw this out there. Uh, I was doing an event with our friend Alan in Wisconsin. Oh, um, awesome. I, I told him I was coming to you. So he sends his regards. 
and and says best of uh, best of luck to all of you in Texas. So uh, normal members in Wisconsin are wishing you guys good luck today. Oh, awesome. I love Alan. Were you on his radio show? Yeah. Heck yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Justin. Until next time, my friend. Got it. See ya. All right. So now I'm going to turn it over to me and Stephen. I guess you can turn it over to yourself. I'm just going to go with that. Um, so Stephen has been working in cannabis law reform for, man, a really long time. Um, in fact, Stephen created one of the first uh, marijuana news um, outlets here in Texas. He worked with Normal Waco, and now we're really happy to have him on the Texas Normal Board as an officer. If you are one of our patients that are sending in your testimony or your video testimony, he is helping edit those, and so he deserves a lot of big thanks, along with our other volunteers, Lisa and Amanda. Um, but what we kind of want to start talking about first is going to be a bill recap about um, penalty reduction, starting with our, our top ones there, and then we'll go move to medical cannabis, retail market, and joint resolutions. Um, I see a whole bunch of comments in our Facebook um, feed, and then also if you want to add some more questions here in the Q&A, you can totally feel free to do so. Uh, so Stephen, how has it been for you um, reviewing all of these bills? How do you feel? <laughs> Well, there's uh, there's a lot of bills this year, and um, not as many bills as there have been in years past. But there seems to be some good bills this this session. Um, you know, we've got uh, three. Uh, I wouldn't call it decrim penalty reduction bills that we're going to talk about. Uh, some good medical bills, and even some uh, adult retail bills. Yeah, and I know last session we had over 60 bills, and I think right now we're sitting at about 25. Um, I know they're trying to put some restrictions on how many bills are filed, so I'm not sure if we'll hit that 60 number before again this time, but we may. Um, so I think let's start off with talking about HB 441, and that is um, Representative Zwiner's bill. Correct. Or actually, I, I never say her name right. I'm sorry. It's Zwiner. I say Zwiner, but it's I Zwiner. thought it was Zwiner also, so. <laughs> well, I think we're both wrong. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah, it does. I unfortunately mispronounce names all the time. I'm not the best with names. Um, but so if you followed last session, then you guys know that Representative Moody has been diligently working to get penalty reduction. He had a civil penalty bill. He negotiated with the governor. He was able to pass it with a supermajority out of the House. I mean, that was a huge deal, the farthest that type of legislation had ever gone. And so he took that iteration of the bill that had the most um, support behind it, and he passed the baton to Rep. Zwiener so that she could now be the advocate for it, so that he could kind of pivot to talking more about retail cannabis, which we'll get to in a, in a second. Um, so, you know, some of our goals, Stephen, are just really making sure that people don't have the collateral consequences. I mean, of course, we want to see a retail market available for people, but how does 441 kind of meet those needs, in your opinion? So the way that works is uh, the bill is going to change uh, session to one ounce from a class B to a class C. Uh, currently, it's uh, four ounces and less is a class B misdemeanor, which is a up to a two thousand dollar fine and one hundred eighty days in jail. Um, class C is just up to a five hundred dollar fine. And so, since the one ounce and less is now a class C, we're going to see one to two ounces a class B misdemeanor. And we're also going to have uh, citations only, no rest. So if you are found in possession of an ounce or less, the law enforcement officer will write you a ticket and you'll be on your way and they'll confiscate uh, any plant material that you have. Now, um, something that was interesting about this bill is that you're eligible for expunction 180 days after dismissal or one year after the citation is issued. And uh, you're also eligible if you're acquitted as well. So, but you have to request the expunction and it requires a $30 fee, not counting any lawyer's fees. But uh, it's, a, it's a good, good basic uh, penalty reduction bill. I think another thing that it does that's um, good is it 
prevents people from losing their driver's license. Because I think that's, you know, kind of the biggest hurdles are that the Class C means you have to check the mark for, you know, criminal misdemeanor, and then the loss of your driver's license for 180 days is awful. And who Mm -hmm. wants to be arrested? Nobody wants to be arrested. Um, So I think that all of those kind of come together to be a really great product. Um, So I'd like to talk about the only Republican bill uh, that has been authored about penalty reduction. That's going to be HB 99 um, from Steve Toss. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a pretty basic, simplistic bill. And I don't mean that, you know, in a condescending way. I just mean it does basic of two ounces or less is going from a B to a C. And it has no suspension of license. And it's non-arrestable. So it does something very similar to what Zwiner's does, but it doesn't have the expunction process. Um, So I think that actually it would be wonderful if the Democrat and the Republican could maybe team up on this and find that middle ground on if that expunction process is something he's willing to add. Um, And perhaps that would make a great power team um, to move that forward. Mm -hmm. I think so. You know, the expunction part is, is great. It's direly needed for a lot of people, but also uh, having the two ounces or less instead of the one ounce or less as a class C misdemeanor would be uh, very helpful. Yeah, I know typically uh, people are purchasing in about one to two ounces um, if they're purchasing for a month, so I feel like that's that's a great mm-hmm. number. Mm-hmm. And then talking about HB uh, 585, get to my notes on that um that is by representative cole and what i like about this is it actually ratchets down um the penalties in a whole bunch of classes so it's not just dealing with small time possession but um it goes even up to as some of you guys might recall there isn't an option for if you're caught with concentrates you can potentially receive up to 99 years in jail which is essentially life and so cole scales all of those back Two ounces or less would go from a class B to a class C. Two to four ounces would go from a class A to a class B. Then um, it would be five pounds, between five pounds and four ounces, excuse me, would Mm -hmm. go from a state jail felony to a class A misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. And then 50 pounds, um, five to 50 pounds would be from a third degree felony to a state jail felony. And then 2,000 pounds is where you can get life. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so that would turn that to a second degree felony. Um, so I think that's super important as well. Which, you know, you can still catch two to 20 years for that, but that's, that's much better than spending 99 years in prison um, for, for possessing a plant that, yeah, it's, it's about on par with alcohol or less, less dangerous than alcohol. Yeah. So, you know, we don't, we don't send people to jail for uh, for life for possessing a whole lot of alcohol on hand. So uh, I like the bill. It's a lot more far reaching and it, it, it goes out and addresses some of those other uh, higher possession counts that other bills haven't addressed in the past. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay. So why don't I uh, just turn it over to you here for a second to talk about the three medical cannabis bills. If you would give us a little rundown of those real quick. Mm-hmm. So let's start with uh, Senate Bill 90, which is uh, Senator Jose Menendez. Uh, so this bill creates an independent testing system, uh, and it also removes the low THC verbiage and replaces that with uh, medical cannabis, which uh, in our current program, it is 0.5 percent THC is the maximum. Uh, under this program, it would no longer uh, be that that maximum amount. And uh, something that other states do and some other states don't is they have reciprocity for uh, uh, card holders out of state. So if you hold a medical cannabis card in another state, then uh, you would be able to uh, have that card uh, work for you here as well. You would be able to possess your medicine, and I believe you would be able to go into a dispensary here and purchase more medicine. Um, It also would protect parental rights. So if uh, if you as a parent uh, are prescribed cannabis, uh, medical cannabis, uh, you wouldn't be penalized for it by having your 
children taken away or be investigated by uh, child protective services. And of course, if your child uh, was taking medical cannabis, uh, they wouldn't be subject to the same whims of CPS as well. Um, another change is that you no longer have to be a physician in order to recommend medical cannabis. Uh, it is now just a medical practitioner and is no longer worded as prescribed. It is now worded as recommend. And of course, prescribed is uh, problematic because uh, whenever you prescribe something that is typically an FDA approved drug and medical cannabis is not an FDA approved drug. Um, so it also expands the list of conditions to encompass a wide array of debilitating medical conditions. There's, there's a lot in this new bill, uh, more that I could sit here and, and list out, um, I, but it's very, very wide, widely encompassing. And uh, we have a list of these bills on our website, which we'll drop a link for so that you can go to it and look at all of the qualifying conditions that would be included there. Now, there's also a provision here which protects uh, properties from seizure uh, if it's used to cultivate, transport, or distribute legal medical cannabis. So if you are out uh, transporting uh, medical cannabis in your vehicle, um, and it's for you, the law enforcement can't come up and say, well, uh, we think this is used in the commission of a crime, even though clearly you don't, you aren't committing a crime here. So we're going to take your vehicle from you. So it gives uh, specific protections from that. Not that that current uh, medical patients are facing that, but I think it's a good built-in protection mechanism. Um, let's see here. So we also have uh, a inclusion here that allows uh, patients to possess uh, at, at minimum 2.5 ounces of plant matter. Uh, now the program director can set uh, maximums and uh, and so, you know, you can't, you can only have this much, but this bill tells them that you can't, that they can't set it lower than two and a half ounces. Um, and also uh, something here that uh, often gets overlooked, I think, is that uh, the licensing for uh, cannabis dispensaries uh, and businesses in general are usually pretty steep. Um, this one, this bill limits it to $5,000 for an initial license fee and then $2,500 for a renewal fee every, every year. So that, that sums up Senate Bill 90. Uh, that's uh, probably our most uh, widely encompassing medical cannabis bill in the legislature so far, um, and may, maybe going forward uh, altogether. Yeah, I just dropped the link too in the comments on Facebook. Um, I'll yes. send an email out to our registrants um, later, but that way they can go to texasnormal.org slash 87-TX-LEDGE. That has all the bills. Stephen is actually keeping them updated for us. And you'll mm -hmm. also see three different links if you would like to take action on penalty reduction, medical cannabis, or retail. So we also have... Uh, one by uh, Senator Carol Alvarado, uh, Senate Bill 250. Um, it really, it's it's really a, a bit odd this bill because uh, I was I was researching it and it doesn't seem to really expand the medical cannabis program in any significant way that I could tell. So uh, this is one to look at. I you know it it helps uh, you know establish the program to to uh, be inclusive for uh, law enforcement access to it so that if you do get pulled over uh, or detained anywhere and they say, well, we don't think that you're actually a medical cannabis patient, you can say, well, you have access to the registry. You can look it up. This is my information. So there's, there's a little bit of a protection there. My um, understanding uh, too is that um, it changes to where the physician actually determines if medical cannabis is the best treatment available to them. Um, so we might want to so. look at that a little bit more. So it, they can determine, I believe, uh, treatment amounts mm -hmm. and they okay. can determine uh, medical use within the framework already established by a prior bill uh, back in, I believe, was it 2019 was the last change. Yeah. Um, but they can't go beyond those conditions. Okay. Is the way I understood it. 
I will definitely have to read that over again. Sometimes that legalese can be like, hey, lawyer, come and tell me what mm-hmm. this says. <laughs> you know how the law is sometimes. It's, yeah. It can be vague and tricky. Um, and then our other medical cannabis bill is HB 43 by Representative Alex Dominguez. And uh, this one does allow the doctors to decide conditions and the amount of medicine needed. And uh, it does reference uh, the existing code, uh, which includes incurable neurodegenerative diseases. But I believe that it encompasses a little bit more than that as well. Um, If it's not listed there, but it's still considered a neurodegenerative disease, that's a lot to say. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Then, uh, Then you do qualify. Uh, it does uh, prevent people from uh, consuming it in a uh, manner which it is smoked. So if you, you cannot burn it or inhale it. So I it's, think almost all of the medical bills have that restriction. So I thought so too, but I did not see that in Senate Bill 90. Okay. I did not see a smoking restriction in Senate Bill 90. So maybe, maybe we need to double check that, but, yeah. but I was actually a little surprised because so far everything that's any, that's gotten anywhere, uh, has required that there, that it not be smokable. Mm-hmm. So, um, and they did raise the smoking age in Texas last session from 18 to 21. So, I mean, that is consistent mm-hmm. with, um, the mood of the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, smoking is, is, is viewed as unhealthy. Um, so it, it would make sense that they would think that it would, should be taken, uh, you know, orally or something like that, like traditional medicine uh, is through, uh, through the pharmacy and whatnot. Um, it does re- remove the low THC cap, and uh, it's no longer referred to as low THC, so it won't be a CBD program anymore, uh, and there'll no longer be a 0.5% THC cap on it. And it also addresses licensing fees as well, though it's not quite as low as Senate Bill 90, but it does limit the license fees to $30,000, which- Well, I mean, uh, that's a great deal less than they are now. (laughs) So uh, I was looking at that, and apparently right now it's $7,000 to apply, Mm -hmm. just to apply, and then $488,000 if you get accepted, and then every year whenever you renew, it's $318,000. So that is drastically lower. So, yeah, that's what we have for the uh, medical cannabis bills. Now, there's, then there's more I out see, there, yeah. but, but these are the, these are the, the ones that, that I think we're going to highlight here. Yeah, because I think just so people know, there's a bunch of ones that add like just PTSD or just chronic pain or smaller bills like that. And we may see more of those. And of course, hopefully these will, we'll see even maybe a few better bills introduced, but this is where we're at right now. I see a lot of questions um, in the stream on Facebook having to do with a retail market. And is it going to pass this year? Um, And so while we can talk about, is it going to pass or not a little bit later, I would like to dive into Moody's bill a little bit because it creates an infrastructure for a retail market um, for adult use and adult is defined as 21 or up which is kind of again in line with the idea of you know alcohol and nicotine here in texas so um, and and not just to purchase it and consume it but also to be you have to be 21 to work in the industry in any facet of the industry yeah um i i don't love that but Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, I can I can understand why. Um, although, can't you bartend when you're 18? In you Texas? can. I believe you can. You can serve and sell alcohol at 18, but apparently you won't be able to uh, tend bud or, or sell it over the counter or anything until you're yeah. 21. <laughs> and um, not ideal, but perhaps something that can be changed in the future or, or a friendly amendment maybe. Um, but it also allows you to possess 2.5 ounces of flour. Mm-hmm. and 15 grams of concentrate so you can possess That's that at any part. time and you can gift it too yes i want someone to gift that to me <laughs> so there, there are some restrictions on the gifting you can give it to other people but you can't publicly advertise that you're doing it right so uh you know i think that's meant to cover more of uh, promotions and stuff like that like do the public giveaway of a car but instead it's it's cannabis but uh i i think as long as you're not advertising it or or publicly flaunting that you're giving it away, then it's okay. Yeah. And so to that end, it also has personal cultivation. Um, If I'm recalling correctly, I think it was 12 plants. And of course, we know that with 12 
plants in different stages, you would be very likely to have more than 2.5 ounces on you. So there is you know, a caveat that for if you are a registered home grower, you can possess up to a, a different amount. I think it was 10 ounces, perhaps. It's 10 um, ounces, and it has to be locked away separate yes. from your 2.5 that you possess on hand. Yes, so yes. you need two safes. <laughs> yes. And for the, your plants, it has to be in a locked area, and it cannot be visible from a public place at all unless it's, uh, you know, visible from like a, an airplane or something like that. And do you recall, was there a restriction that you would not be able to cultivate your own if you were within a certain distance of like a school? See, it said that you couldn't, it couldn't be visible from a school, uh, but it, I don't think that it said anything about being within a certain distance of school, but I wouldn't be surprised if that gets added later on. Okay. And then I think another thing that it does that it doesn't necessarily have to because drugged driving or impaired driving is already a thing, but it does explicitly disallow driving while under the influence. I think all of us know we need to be responsible consumers no matter what we're consuming. Um, but I think that that's just in there to be very explicit and to make sure that, you know, people know that this is not just like a party pass. Um, you can party but not in your car. <laughs> well, it's it's very uh, encompassing because it doesn't just say cars. It says any motorized vehicle. So yeah, it boats. If, if you're in a boat, an airplane, if you're flying an airplane, <laughs> you, you uh, couldn't be on a uh, on a tractor or a lawnmower, anything mm -hmm. with a motor, uh, you won't be able to operate while under the influence. Now, it doesn't seem the to- The lawnmower has me laughing. <laughs> well, you know, people do that. <laughs> <laughs> this is texas yes they do <laughs> but it's not clear there how they plan to determine whether or not you are under the influence so they do have um under the influence you know testing roadside sobriety testing that they do they and i went testing. yeah i went to a triple a um educational seminar that they were giving to law enforcement here in Austin a couple years ago. And they actually said at that point in time, of course, that the best and most effective way to tell if someone actually was inebriated because the, um, you know, blood tests are not necessarily accurate. You don't really know what is an intoxication level for each person. You know, there hasn't been the study in that, but they said it really is that roadside sobriety test that's going to be the most accurate for the law enforcement. So we'll see how that goes. I know some technology has come around since then, um, but that will be very interesting to see how they deal with that. Mm -hmm. So something we talk about a lot is tax rate, right? In a retail market, we want the taxes to be low enough that people do not continue to participate in, you know, the gray or the illicit market. Um, just because it's nice for, you know, people to know that they're having tested products and everything. Um, and so in Moody'sville, he does have a, a pretty conservative tax rate of 10% and, um, and has a, interesting distribution plan. So he says, it, I, I like this because it's kind of like incentivizing having a dispensary in your area. So out of that 10% tax proceeds, you know, you've got your bundle of money. So 10% would go to municipalities that have establishments. 10% would go to counties that have establishments. 1% would go to the testing and control fund. And then the remainder of whatever's left would go to the public teacher school fund. So that's how they've decided to allot the revenue that taxes um, would be bringing in. Well, there is a small bit in there. It doesn't, doesn't designate a percentage or anything or a number, but it says that uh, some of the uh, tax money goes to the program to help administrative fees or administrative costs. Okay, in and addition so to that. Yes, okay. that would that would that's undetermined because I guess they don't know yet what that would be, and it might change on a year to year basis. Yeah, and it's probably something that the, you know the um, department that's in charge would probably oversee whenever they get to the regulatory process. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there were a few more points in this bill that I thought were interesting as well. Um, you know, if you possess uh, cannabis, that's you know legal for adult consumption. Uh, it can't be used against you uh, to take your child away or if you are in a child custody battle or are being determined whether or not you can see your child or have conservatorship over your child, uh, it won't impact that. So there's protections in this bill regarding that. Um, also, uh, residential tenants cannot be prohibited from possessing cannabis. So if you rent uh, the, the 
property owner can't tell you that, well, you can't possess this uh, because this bill uh, has that protection built in for it. Um, and then also another big point here, and uh, props to Moody on this, is uh, if you were previously arrested for cannabis possession or distribution, I believe, uh, and you were convicted, you still get to participate in the uh, cannabis industry here in Texas. So some places, once you get a, a misdemeanor or felony conviction for a drug case uh, for marijuana, you're, you're out. You can't participate at all. But this, this would allow you to, uh, to participate here in Texas, which is a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so real quick, um, before we go any farther, I see a question that I want to answer just real fast. Will there be penalty reductions for edibles and concentrates? Um, there is one bill currently that will deal with that, and it's authored by um, Canales in the House. And so I just did want to let you guys know that, and you can go to the TexasNormal.org page and, and read up on that one. Um, there is also one in the Senate that has to do with concentrate. And that's a, it's a very important topic because I think a lot of people don't really know that it's a first-degree state jail felony to possess any concentrate, right? And that's, that's harsh jail time. Um, so very important topic, Robin. Thank you very much for making sure we touch on that. Um, yeah, it's a lot of people don't understand that if you walk around with one of those vape pens, that if you get caught with that, that's a felony. You're going to jail, and you might be able to plead it down, but, but that's a tough charge to beat. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and before hemp was legal, people were, um, you know, in, in June of 2019, when it officially became legal, before that, people were walking around um, with hemp stuff a lot, too, and getting in trouble for it and thinking that, oh, it's legal in all 50 states. Um, so, unfortunately, it wasn't. And, you know, there was like a grandma in Corpus Christi that was like, I got this for my arthritis, and she got in a lot of trouble. So, work to be done on that for sure. Anything else, though, that we want to touch on about the retail market? Uh, no, I think that's about it. Okay. Um, so, you know, we had a few miscellaneous bills um, I'd like to jump to. I think you and I had talked about doing joint resolutions next, but let's jump to the miscellaneous bills real quick. Um, so talking about hemp possession, right? Um, Collier authored a hemp protection bill. So basically, if you think that you're buying hemp and it says it's a hemp product, but then you get caught with it and they test it and it's more than 0.3%, it offers you a protection, a, a defense to that um, because you were under the impression that you were purchasing a legal product. Now, it is an affirmative defense, meaning that you don't get to plead that to the police officer right then and there. Correct. Because they're they're going to they're gonna do whatever they're going to do. But you do get to go to the DA or go to court and say, hey, you know, I thought I was buying this legal product. All this packaging here says it's legal. Um, so I, the law says I shouldn't be prosecuted for this. So there, there is an out, but uh, it doesn't protect you on the front end of things. It's on the back end. Yeah. And then, you know, this um, bill that King authored having to do with drug testing, he authors this bill almost every session. And I don't ever remember it moving at all, but we always tracked it because um, if you're familiar with, there's a program called Temporary Assistance for Needy Families called TANF or TANF, and um, they want to include marijuana testing in there so that if you are positive for marijuana, you would be excluded from being able to apply or receive assistance. Excluded for 12 months. Yes. The first time. Now, if you get excluded, and then you go and complete a drug rehabilitation class and come back six months later and submit to continuous drug testing and, and pass your drug test, then you can, you can get back into the program. Now, if you don't and you come back after 12 months and you apply to the program again and then you fail your drug test another time, then you're ineligible for 36 months. Oh. And then after that, if you – fail a drug test a third time for any reason you're completely disqualified from the program for life mm -hmm. wow it's pretty uh pretty that's strange. harsh but it never it never moves it, it i don't even know that it gets hearings um, i don't remember it ever having a hearing in all hearings. these years but but i see this every year because you know i track it every session all the cannabis related bills and this one always comes up it's always the same yeah. so I, I don't see it moving 
Um, and would you mind talking a little bit about that expunction bill that Collier offered, 859? Yes. So uh, this one actually doesn't even say anything directly about marijuana, cannabis, anything like that. But what it does is uh, if you are arrested or convicted of a misdemeanor offense that at some point becomes de decriminalized or for which you've completed any requirements set forth by a court, you are eligible to uh, have it expunged from your record. And of course, and it just kind of outlines that process, right? Yes. And it's a $30 fee and you can do it yourself or you can have a lawyer do it for you. And there's some organizations out there, I believe, that will do it for free. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, just so everybody knows who's watching this, um, on the 18th, the Foundation for an Informed Texas is putting on a seminar, and a portion of that is an expunction workshop. So you can participate, you can watch that workshop, and that way you, if you would like to try to get an expunction done for yourself, that should be very helpful, hopefully save you a little bit of funding on the lawyer, um, if, if not the application fee. <laughs> And that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say that's that's pretty much the uh, the bill for 859. It's a very simple bill, but it's very far reaching. So uh, you know, if all else, it would be great to see this bill pass because it would encompass a whole lot of things where people are being discriminated against for their jobs, uh, mm -hmm. for uh, where they where they want to live, stuff like that, for minor stuff that that they can just have expunged from the record, and then it's still there that. Law enforcement knows it's there, I believe, but uh, it doesn't show up on regular criminal background, background checks. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk real quick before we, you know, transition to COVID protocols about joint resolutions. Mm -hmm. So you have your regular bills, right? We've been talking about regular bills here. They move through the process that we've outlined in many of our workshops, go through the House, go through the Senate land on the governor's desk, become a law, right? A joint resolution is different. What a joint resolution is, is it's actually an amendment to our constitution. It's a measure that requires adoption by both chambers of the legislature, but doesn't require action from the governor. So what happens is a legislator authors a joint resolution, it has to pass with a supermajority out of both chambers. And then instead of going to the governor, it actually goes to the secretary of state to be added to the next ballot. So the, that following November's election or whichever election is stipulated in the joint resolution. I was going to say and not it, necessarily because, uh, you know, it's two thirds majority and it usually specifies in the bill which election it will go for. Usually right. it's the following one, but but sometimes it would be the one after that. Yeah, so they can push it out if they would like to. So let's say they don't want it to be in an off year. They want it to be in a presidential election year. You know, they, they can absolutely do that. Um, and so it bypasses the governor, though, and goes to the secretary of state. They put it on whichever election has been decided on there. And then that's when the campaigning starts. That's whenever, you know, we're going to be talking about how wonderful it is and the police are going to be talking about how the sky is going to fall. Right. There's going to be a lot of funds putting it, put into that campaign, I'm sure, on behalf of law enforcement. Um, and hopefully it passes. And if it does pass, what it does is it goes back to the legislature for them to now write what they think the law should look like. And then that moves through the legislature. And once it's passed and approved by the governor, then it goes through the regulatory process and then it's implemented. So this can be easily a three-year process um, to get a joint resolution passed. So I just like to make sure that people understand um, some of the difficulties of a joint resolution. I know a lot of people are like, let's get it on the ballot, let's get it on the ballot. Um, but it's, it's a difficult process because you are changing our constitution. So they're having a similar issue in New Jersey right now. Um, you know, back last year, they voted to legalize cannabis in New Jersey. And everyone was like, great, it's legal. We don't need to do anything else. Well, it's, it's kind of similar to Texas in that uh, just because the voters voted to legalize it, it, they still have to wait for the legislature to – craft all of the framework for it and the, the, the regulations and then send it to the governor and then the governor has to sign it and then it has to be uh, sent to all of the various agencies that implement all of the regulations and rules and whatnot. And, and so they're talking about even though they passed it last year, it might not be till next year or the year after before 
they actually see any actual retail sales of cannabis in New Jersey. Yeah, so, it's kind yeah. of like whenever the Texas Compassionate Use Program was created, mm -hmm. you know, there was not cannabis in patients' hands for almost two years. Mm -hmm. Passed in 2015, we didn't see anything until 2017. Yeah, absolutely right. 2018 um, actually, was it? Mm. Don't get me telling stories. <laughs> Anyways, I want to yes, say it was yes, mid to late 17 because we were like wanting them to implement it before the 17 session so we could get improvements on it. And they were like, mm, we're going to let it sit because we don't want you to do anything else. Yeah. which was frustrating lots of feet dragging <laughs> yeah um so real quick before uh well, well let me just say first of all these joint resolutions there's one for medical and one for legalization in both the house and the senate so there's four joint resolutions that have currently been filed um you can take a look at those on the site they're like a half page it's really just like we're gonna put legalization on the ballot and that's that's it, <laughs> you know, so, um, but before we go on to the COVID protocols, um, Bill has a question. He says, is there a bill raising medical THC from 0.5 to 5%? So there is a couple bills that totally remove the THC cap and that would leave it to the doctor's discretion to let the doctor decide what the proper and right dosing would be. But I think that the bill that um, Bill might be talking about is actually Senator Gutierrez's bill. It's a legalization bill with a medical component to it. And so it would legalize um, adult use cannabis, but also what it would do is it would carve out an affirmative defense for patients, it would create an opioid disclosure that um, doctors would then have to give to all of their patients. It also creates that patient registry that we've talked about with several bills so that people can't dock shop. You know, they want one physician to one patient and that way law enforcement can see it. But it also raises that THC cap up to 5%. However, there's one issue. We used to also have a CBD floor that you had to have a certain amount of CBD. They removed that last session, and this has given licensees the ability to kind of play with their formulations. You might get a lot of substrate, um, but they're able to do more high THC uh, products. But what this bill would do is it would also now create a CBD floor as well. 5% THC and at least 10% CBD. And the only conditions that it would add would be acute and chronic pain. So not ideal, um, but definitely does make some changes. So I think that that might be what you were speaking about, Bill. Um, now so that, yeah. question, that question reminded me uh, of something about Joe Moody's bill, the adult retail market bill. Um, there is a provision in there that allows the, uh, the program director, whoever's going to oversee this new market, to implement a THC cap in products. And it does by not weight or by content. Okay, I want to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll give that a once over. Okay, so I'm. First of all, let me say that next Tuesday is the first day of session. Um, they're going to meet in the house. They're going to you know all be sworn in, and then they will nominate the speaker in the Senate. They'll all be sworn in and then do whatever they're going to do because <laughs> they don't have to nominate someone in that chamber. Um, but as of right now, they have not created official COVID protocol. That's something that they will adopt the guidelines for during that first week of session. So we've seen some drafts of what it might look like, but it won't be official or voted by the body until sometime next week. Now, just to give a little bit of clarification on, you know, who's in charge of what up at the Capitol, I think it's important to know that the House will make their rules for how their chamber and their offices are going to go, and they're going to have some discretion within their offices, but they will have their guidelines. Then the Senate will also have their own guidelines for their chamber and their offices. Then the State Preservation Board, which is in charge of um, – the Capitol building and everything that's not the chambers, they also will have their own guidelines. Um, and then there's DPS, who is security. So at some point, we might even see them implement um, some type of uh, restriction. So what I'm going to tell you guys is generally not finalized, but it's a lot of what we 
anticipate we'll see and what people have put out um, notices about. And we'll make sure that we tell you next week, you know, what is final when it's official. But I also want you guys to know that at any moment, those guidelines can change. You know, today, just on Monday, the Capitol opened for the first time um, in months, nine months almost. But then today it was shut down because of um, what's happening in D.C. So expect the unexpected, but let's start off uh, with the basics. So these are from the State Preservation Board. We anticipate that these will generically stay the same unless there's some kind of outbreak. But they're basically saying that the public can only be in the building Monday through Friday from 9 to 6. Saturday and Sunday, it will be closed for cleaning. The public can only enter via one entrance, and it's going to be the north door of the Capitol because it's wheelchair accessible. COVID-19 testing is going to be highly recommended, and the North Plaza will allow people to be tested at no expense. No personal data will be collected, they say. They also say that they can test uh, 12 people an hour. So that's not a lot, considering thousands of people are in the Capitol sometimes. They're saying that a mask will have to be worn over your mouth and nose at all times while you're inside the building. Public visitor capacities will be observed. Social distancing, distancing I can't say it because I've tried to say it so many times. Social distancing will also uh, be required in public spaces. Deliveries have to be left at the loading dock. No personnel will be let in. There will be no tour groups, no um, public tours around the capital. capital. There will be no sponsored event space at, available at all. And um, that's just for the generic area around the Capitol. So the House and the Senate will manage access to their own office and to the assemblies once they've convened. Um, so highly encourage that any visitors definitely check in with their member's office to see what the most up-to-date information is. But some of the restrictions that we anticipate seeing are temperature and system. Ugh. Why can't I talk all of a sudden? It's because I've been doing too much talking today, Stephen. You're right about the back-to-back. -back. Um, so temperature and system, sim I keep saying system, <laughs> symptom checks. So do you have a temperature? Do you have any of the symptoms of COVID? There will be plexiglass dividers, not only on the dais, but on the floor between the desk mates. Um, most staff won't be allowed on the dais at all. In the Senate, they will be allowed, and they'll have to be regularly tested for COVID. They're talking about limiting the number of witnesses that can convene at any time. The auditorium will not be available because that will likely be overflow, as well as any of the other extra meeting rooms. And this means that they're likely to um, restrict how many committees are meeting at any given time. So likely they'll meet every other week instead of every week like they normally do. They want to limit the number of bills that are being assigned to each committee. So it's really going to be the priority legislation. Whereas we typically see a lot of, you know, custom bills here and there being thrown around. You know, we see like six to 10,000 bills being filed. I don't know that we'll see that many. They definitely will not be making it to committee as any favors. It will just be the, the business that they know we have to get done. There'll also be food service restrictions and limited access to the chambers. The media will be allowed in the gallery instead of the floor, and they're saying that they might only allow one um, pool reporter to even be present. It's unknown if the public will be allowed or not yet. They've put air purification systems in both of the chambers, but they still have to be installed in the committee rooms, the conference rooms, and every single office which just so you know, there's 181 legislators and there's way more offices than that. <laughs> so um, what does this mean for us? It's gonna be a big change. It means that we're gonna be doing a lot of virtual meeting and conversing with legislators and staff. So all these years that Texas Normal has been saying again and again, make that relationship, build that relationship. Um, it, it's gonna come down to have you been doing that and do you have that relationship to make sure that they're really listening to you during this extremely strange session. It also means there's not gonna be any big lobby days. Um, you may have recalled that um, last session in 2019, on a Tuesday, we had over 420 people, I think it was 425 people up at the Capitol dressed professionally to talk about cannabis. We also typically do educational exhibits in the hearing hallway where we take the opportunity to talk to legislators as they're walking back and forth doing their business. However, it will only be unmanned educational exhibits this year, and there is a possibility that even those could potentially be canceled. 
They're also requesting that we do contactless and digital handouts and materials. So there's less um, exchanging of things between people. And then um, what we advise is that you prepare your testimony in advance in case there's very strict witness guidelines for participation. So again, if you go texasnormal.org and click that 87th ledge tab, there's going to be a link there where you can submit your testimony and Stephen and Lisa and Amanda will take a look at it and edit it and get it ready for the session. Um, and just stay flexible, you guys. Prepare for this to change at any given moment. Um, what we're going to do is next week on the 12th, we're going to be hosting a workshop at 7 p.m. to just go over priority legislation, any newly filed bills, walk you guys through the process step by step, um, talk about um, some of the intricacies, and then we're going to do a live stream once the guidelines have officially been accepted. So I anticipate maybe the following Saturday we should have all those in and we should be able to follow up with you guys on that. So I encourage you to register for that workshop. It's in the evening, so hopefully you can join us. Um, did I miss anything, Stephen, out of all of these multitude of restrictions? No, I think that's it. I, I did want to say that, uh, you know, We've been thanking our volunteers for helping us with the testimonies and you know thank you to them but also thank you to robin who's been helping us as well oh i didn't know robin was helping us thank you robin. yes <laughs> thank you to you too i need to meet robin then um so you know i think that that's all i have for this evening's um information i'm going to just kind of scroll real quick and see if we missed any questions um mark is saying the workshop on the 12th is it at noon or 7 p.m it is at 7 p.m. Originally, we had scheduled it for noon, but then um, we decided, you know, there's going to be a lot going on during the day there, um, so we changed that. I'm going to get the link for you, Mark, and I'll drop it there so that you can RSVP for that. It's going to be a Zoom link, so you can register, and here we go. You can also go to our website and find it, but I'm just going to put it here for you, Mark. Go, sent to you. Okay, so Julian wants to know, um, will Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick succeed in changing the Senate rules when session convenes to allow a simple majority to block votes on the Senate floor? So for those of you that don't know, um, the majority used to be like 21, and then they whittled it down to, I think it was 19? or 20. And now they're saying they want to make it even lower. They want to make it 18 for the majority. And this is so that they can push things through. Um, he's been successful every other time at doing it. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if it happens again, to be quite honest. Do you have any thoughts about that, Stephen? Well, right now, the Republicans hold a 19 member majority in the Senate. Um, but I mean, the uh, Lieutenant Governor can can block a lot of stuff from even coming up so they may not even need to do that yeah yeah um and then i see another question about you know what's the possibility of a retail market bill passing this session um you know when we talk about probabilities it's really hard to know what might happen between now and really if our bills haven't moved to a certain position by april they're dead so we have between now and april to do all of the work i I can say personally, I've never seen an appetite to talk about retail with legislators in their office like I've seen this time around. I think that that is specifically due to COVID having such an impact on our budget. And, um, and then that report that came out from VS talking about all the tax and licensing fees that can be brought in. So I think that, you know, there is a possibility it can pass, but I would think it would be maybe more likely next session, and I don't want to be pessimistic, but typically legislation, one, from the first session it's uh, authored, it usually takes about three to four sessions for it to actually pass. Um, so we just have to make sure that we have the conversation and get it as far as we can so that we have you know, a marker where we can try to beat that next time and get it farther and, and make sure that we get it implemented. But I do have a lot of confidence that we'll be able to improve the program even more. 
I'm also very hopeful that we'll be able to reduce the penalties and then having a robust conversation about retail. While there is a chance, um, I do think it may take another session for that to happen. You know, you're struggling with words today. I'm struggling with numbers. It's actually 18 Republicans in the Senate, not 19. Yeah, because I, th I was thinking in my head, I think that's why he's changing it to 18, though, right? Yes, it's 18. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't think that I have any other questions here. Are there any final thoughts that you want to share with our friends here today, Stephen? Uh, you know, um, really, it's it's all about you know, connecting with your representative, your senator, um, you know, tell your story, be compelling, concise, personable, um, genuine. And, uh, you know, I think we're providing a lot of tools for, uh, for people to do that. We've, uh, we've got uh, examples on how to write your testimony. Uh, we've got information on how to contact them, what to talk to them about. I believe we're even going to uh, have a workshop on that as well. So, uh, you know, tune in to, uh, to our workshop, uh, look at our resources and, uh, you know, we're, we'll help you, uh, you know, put forth your best, your best possible story. And, uh, hopefully we can change some minds this, this year. I agree. And, you know, I've been having a lot of meetings with people and, um, I'm hearing a lot that, you know, the work we've done in past sessions has set us up really well this session. And so while I'm, I think like anyone else, a little nervous about how the COVID restrictions will affect it. I'm confident that um, we will continue to be flexible. We will continue to overcome and hopefully get as much as we can out of this session because we need it. But I also want to let everybody know the likelihood of a special session is extremely high because it's likely that census data won't even be available until July and they have to use that data to do their redistricting. Um, so I'm happy to say that likely redistricting, which is a very contentious thing to deal with, will be after the session. So I'm glad to know that that likely won't bleed onto our issue because it's been a bipartisan issue by and large, and I would really like it to stay that way. <laughs> well, I think on that note, um, I, I'll just say thank you to you, Stephen, and Justin, who's not here, and everyone who's watching and uh, will watch later for participating in our state and how we get things done and for supporting Texas Normal. It's really important to us that um, we're representing the stakeholders, the members and our network and making sure that all ideas and thoughts are being listened to so that we can really learn from mistakes and make the best decisions from Texas. But ultimately it comes down to each and every one of you reaching out to your legislator. So I strongly encourage you to click on that um, activist training guide and follow through the steps. Um, Steven actually just made a video on how to find and contact your legislators. It's only three minutes and he literally walks you through step-by-step -step where to click and what links to go to. So it's a really great resource source if you would like to delve in and start working on that now. It's so simple to uh, to figure out who your representative is and how to contact them, you know, walk you through all of that. And you're going to have a, a tougher time getting up the nerve to call them than you will actually figuring out how to do it. And you know, I got to say, whenever I first started doing all this, uh, you know, I was nervous and sick to my stomach the first time I started calling these people. But, you know, they're you call and you, someone answers the phone and they ask you who you are and, and what you're calling about today. You just tell them, you, you know, I'm calling about this, this issue or this bill. And this is what I, you know, what I want. And this is where I live. And, and thank you for your time. It's very simple. So, uh, you know, make the phone calls. And of course, uh, you know, write a physical letter. Uh, you know, plenty of people get emails these days, but you know, that you don't get too many physical letters anymore. So I, I think that's a nice touch as well. Absolutely. Um, well, I think on that note, um, let's bid each other adieu. I'm going to go relax for my evening, what's left of it. And I had a really great time spending it with you today, Stephen. So thank you for all that you're doing. And I will see you. I'll probably talk to you before I see you <laughs> in reality <Absolutely>. world. <laughs> <laughs> the way things are right now. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. And good night. Thank you, Jax.